Good afternoon, or good morning, depending on your location, and welcome. I'm David Wise with Foley and Lardner, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's web conference entitled Antitrust Issues in Labor and Employment. Before I turn the presentation over to our speaker, Ben Dryden, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's program will last approximately one hour, followed by a short question and answer session. We encourage you to submit written questions during the program. To do so, please type your question into the Q&A widget open on the left-hand side of your screen. Ben will respond to most or all of those written questions at the end of the program, time permitting. The web console you are looking at can be completely customized. You can resize or move any of the windows that you have open, including maximizing the PowerPoint presentation on your screen. If you experience technical difficulties during the presentation, please visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the help widget below the presentation window, which is designated with a question mark icon. The PowerPoint presentation will be available on our website at foley.com in the next few days, or you can get a copy of the slides in the resource list widget. Today's program is being recorded and, as mentioned, will be available on Foley's website in the next few days. And now I'd like to turn the presentation over to today's speaker, Ben Dryden. Thank you, David, uh, and thank you for everyone for joining us today. As David mentioned, my name is Ben Dryden. I am a antitrust attorney in the Washington, D.C. office of the law firm Foley & Lardner LLP, where I have a pretty broad civil antitrust practice that ranges from litigation to government investigations and merger clearance to just day-to-day -day antitrust compliance counseling. And you know, one, one of the fun parts of my practice is that I, I serve as a secondary member to Foley's Labor and Employment Practice Group and help uh, advise on issues that arise in the labor and employment context where, where uh, the, there can be antitrust problems or implications. And so it's kind of this fun little sub-niche of uh, crossing two different disciplines, antitrust and labor and employment law, and I'm delighted to have everyone here today to just get a one-hour overview of where these two areas intersect. So. We've got uh, uh, just an overview slide. I'll, I'll show you a roadmap where we're going today. Today we've got uh, you know a, a, a range of people attending from very seasoned attorneys down to non-attorney HR personnel. And so I thought just as a beginning matter, it'd be helpful to give a, a five or ten minute overview of the antitrust laws generally, just so we all have a common foundation, can understand the basic antitrust concepts. From there, we're going to turn to some special issues that arise in the labor and employment context. From there, we're going to turn to some guidance that the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice released last year. Uh, it, it's antitrust guidance specifically for human resources professionals. We're then going to turn to sort of a quirky little issue that actually comes up in the executive compensation context when you have highly compensated officers or directors or employees. And with our remaining time, we'll just talk about how you can incorporate antitrust compliance into your regular corporate compliance policies and employee training and onboarding. So without further ado, I want to begin with just a, a quick high-level overview of the antitrust laws generally. And I thought I would begin with my favorite quote in the whole world about antitrust. Uh, it's a quote from Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall who said that the antitrust laws in general and the Sherman Act in particular are the Magna Carta of free enterprise. They are as important to the preservation of economic freedom and our free enterprise system as the Bill of Rights is to the protection of our fundamental personal freedoms. And the freedom guaranteed each and every business, no matter how small, is the freedom to compete, to assert with vigor, imagination, devotion, and ingenuity whatever economic muscle it can muster. So in a word, the antitrust laws serve to promote competition. And I should pause and say that the focus of today's talk is going to be on the federal antitrust laws in the United States, but there are antitrust laws in other countries. Uh, more than 100 other countries around the world, and the majority of U.S. states also have their own state antitrust laws, but uh, 
they they all follow both historically and intellectually from the federal uh, the the U.S. federal antitrust laws. So that's what we're really going to focus on today. Um, but again, in a word, antitrust law serves to promote competition, and economics teaches us that competition is valuable in a free enterprise system because it leads to all sorts of other good things. Competition, all else equal, leads to more goods and services being made, uh, cheaper goods and services being sold, better quality, more innovative goods and services. And so, you know, the, the, the antitrust laws try to protect that competitive force that leads to all these other good things. I should say also that the antitrust laws borrow very heavily from the discipline of economics, and economics is a very fluid discipline, by, by which I mean it has changed greatly over time. The things that an economist today believes might be very different than the things that an economist 50 years ago or 100 years ago would have believed, and so the law has evolved as economics has evolved, and it makes it just a, a fun and, I think, interesting uh, area of law to practice on. So the Sherman Act, which uh, Justice Marshall said in particular is the embodiment of the, the, the antitrust laws, is, is really where it all begins. And the history here is uh, the, the, you know, step back to the 1890s, there are these very powerful coal trusts and oil trusts and steel trusts and and they they, they were very powerful and you know the, the just day-to-day -day workers uh were, were jealous of that uh, economic power and the economic power was doing some pretty harmful things to competition so a u.s senator by the name of john sherman who's pictured on this slide sat down and wrote a law to fix it uh now, a couple words on Senator Sherman. He was sort of an interesting figure in history. He had served in both houses of Congress. He'd been a Treasury Secretary. He ran for, uh, to be nominated uh, for president. He was also the younger brother of uh, Union Civil War General William Tecumseh Sherman, who had famously burnt down the city of Atlanta and marched to the sea. And, in fact, John Sherman was instrumental in getting his brother's appointment to the Army. So for that reason alone, he's an important figure in U.S. history. But his, his signature, uh, you know, accomplishment in world history is penning the Sherman Act. And the legislative history is pretty explicit that his approach was, you know, here's the idea we're trying to get across. I'm going to write in very broad strokes, and I'll leave it to the courts to actually iron out the details. And so he sat down and he wrote the Sherman Act, and the, the courts have very faithfully, you know, taken that charge and interpreted it over the course of the next 127 years to today. But it's interesting that language hasn't really changed that much. So the original antitrust statute, the Sherman Act, it was written 127 years ago. That that statute is still pretty much uh, intact. And so there's two main sections of the Sherman Act, Section 1 Section 2. Section 1 says that every contract combination in the form of trust or otherwise or conspiracy and restraint of trade or commerce is declared to be illegal. And I, I'll pause. You know, back in the 1890s, the, the concept of a legal corporate entity was still a relatively new concept. And so corporate law just wasn't as developed as it is today. And one thing that corporate law hadn't really figured out was how to have one company merge with another company. There, there was just no concept of a legal corporate merger. So the way they got around that was some clever Wall Street uh, attorneys in the 1800s said, well, what if we just have a bunch of companies put together in a trust to be managed for the benefit of the owners of the companies. And so that's legally how they got around the inability to create mergers. And it's that legal fiction that they created a trust instead of a merger that led to the, the Sherman Act saying every contract combination or, for, uh, or conspiracy in the form of trust. And that's why it's called antitrust law. No other country in the world has that historical problem. So every other country just calls it competition law. But in the U.S., we call it antitrust law because of Section 1 of the Sherman Act. So that's Section 1. Section 2 says, every person who shall monopolize or attempt to monopolize shall be deemed guilty of a felony. 
and just a accident of history, Section 2 of the Sherman Act governs what one person or company can do standing in its own. Uh, Section 1 of the Sherman Act governs what two or more companies working together can do. So Section 2 governs one company. Section 1 governs two companies. So with that, we'll, we'll begin with Section 2 of the Sherman Act. We'll take the, the second one first. So if you ask just some Joe on the street, hey, what do you know about antitrust law? You know, odds are that what they'll say is, I don't know, it prevents monopolies. It makes it illegal to have a monopoly. And that's not quite right. So monopolies happen for antitrust purposes all the time, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with having a monopoly. A, you know, an example is you're a small community hospital in some rural county, and there's just not enough people in the county to justify having two or three hospitals. There's just one. You know, for, for legal purposes, that's monopoly. And I should pause and say that monopoly doesn't necessarily mean you have a 100% market share. If you have a less than 30% market share, you're probably not a monopoly. But above 30%, it starts to get a little fuzzier. So for antitrust purposes, uh, you know, it happens all the time that there are big companies that have large shares of a market. It might be a small market. It might be a large market. But it happens all the time. And as long as the reason you have that monopoly is because you were the first mover or you have you, you built a better mousetrap or you were just smarter than your competition or maybe it was just some historical accident. You know, the, the other company made a bad investment and went out of business. As long as you didn't do anything untoward to get that monopoly, it is perfectly lawful under Section 2 of the Sherman Act to have that monopoly. What's illegal under Section 2 is monopolization, which means deliberately doing something to achieve or perpetuate a monopoly through something other than good faith competition on the merits. So an example, this is the classic example, but economics teaches it doesn't actually happen that often, but it's a classic example, predatory pricing. You've got one competitor in town, you've got deeper pockets than your competitor. You say, hey, I'm just going to sell really, really cheap, maybe I'll even sell my products at a loss, that both I and my competitor really suffer, but I've got deeper pockets, so my competitor will go out of business, and then once they're out of business, I'll jack up my prices, I'll have a monopoly, and I'll, I'll, I'll make my money back and more. Economics teaches that that doesn't really happen in practice, but if it were to happen, that would be a predatory pricing theory. You were doing something other than competing on the merits, you're trying deliberately to give yourself a monopoly, even though you're no more efficient or no, no better of a competitor than your, your counterpart across town. Another example is patent fraud. You know, when you get a patent from the government that is a legal piece of paper that says you hereby have a monopoly for the next 20 years or however long, and uh, you're, you are required to when you apply for a patent, disclose if there are other inventions that do the same thing as the thing you're claiming a patent on. If you were to lie on that application and claim that you invented something that you didn't actually invent, that's bad faith competition. You are not competing on the merits. You, you, you are doing something predatory. So if you do something like that, you, you're at risk of a Section 2 violation. But really short of something like that, it is hard to violate Section 2 of the Sherman Act. Section 2 of the Sherman Act is pretty laissez-faire, uh, but that's only when you're talking about one company acting on its own. In contrast, Section 1 of the Sherman Act governs when two companies work together, and it actually regulates that sort of joint or multi-firm conduct pretty extensively. The thinking from the Supreme Court's perspective is that joint conduct deprives the marketplace of the independent centers of decision-making that competition assumes and demands. And so, of course, it happens all the time that two companies will work together in some collaborative way. But whenever you're doing that, Section 1 of the Sherman Act will allow that action to at least be reviewed in some limited respect. So there's basically two levels of review that can apply under Section 1 of the Sherman Act. First is if you're doing something collusive. And the reason is that the supreme evil of the antitrust laws is collusion. By collusion, I mean price fixing. Teaming up with your competitor to say, let's not undersell each other, let, let, let's charge the same amount, and we'll, we'll, we'll stop competing. 
if you do that, there's a fair chance you will go to jail or at a minimum get sued. Other examples of collusive activity include bid rigging or uh, allocating a market, say, you know, teaming up with a competitor, I'll have the east side of town and you'll have the west side of town and uh, we, we won't play in each other's sandboxes. If you do that, that, that is deemed collusion and that uh, all, all these collusive types of activities are deemed illegal per se. If you do something like this, as a matter of law, you have violated Section 1 of the Sherman Act. There's a couple other examples. A group boycott. So an example of a group boycott is, let's say there's five companies that all make the same basic thing, and they all sell through Amazon. And Amazon's just killing their margins because Amazon you know, forces them to, to cut their prices and their margins. And so they all team together and say, hey, let's all agree not to sell through Amazon. That, that's a group boycott of Amazon. A group boycott is per se unlawful under Section 1 of the Sherman Act, or an agreement to restrict output. Let's never sell more than a 1,000 widgets, whatever we're making. All that's per se unlawful. There's a relatively small number of types of collusive activities that are deemed unlawful per se. As long as you're not doing something like that, one of those core collusive activities, Section 1 of the Sherman Act can still apply to your agreements or your, your, your joint conduct with other companies, but it's a much more liberal standard. The, the legal term is the rule of reason, where it's basically a regulator or a court will just balance and say, well, is the good that comes from this better than the bad, or is the bad outweigh the good? And if the bad outweighs the good, they can stop you, break it up. But if the good outweighs the bad, which it usually does, uh, an example is you have an exclusive agreement with the supplier, I'll only buy from you. Well, that, that type of agreement can actually have all sorts of good benefits. It gives you a sure flow of supply and you know, allows you to achieve uniformity. But you're, the government's allowed to review that, or a plaintiff, plaintiff's attorney could, could file a lawsuit to review that. But the, the takeaway is you know, really stay away from the things that are per se illegal and everything else. You know, have your radar screen up because the Sherman Act can't apply, but uh, you're not going to go to jail for that. And I, I, I should also pause and say that th there's several different ways that the Sherman Act is enforced. It's first and foremost a criminal statute, um, but criminal prosecution as a matter of practice is limited to when you're engaged in those hardcore, per se unlawful types of activities. So as long as you're not doing something like that, uh, the, the Sherman Act is typically enforced civilly. Uh, the government can file a lawsuit to break up uh, an arrangement or to, to enjoin an arrangement. Uh, uh, a, a private party that's been harmed by some anti-competitive practice can file a lawsuit. If they can prove that they were harmed by a million dollars, they stand to collect three million dollars. Three times their out-of-pocket harm. Um, sometimes these cases lead to really large class action lawsuits, and you, you can have an antitrust case that has billions of dollars at stake. But that, that's the Sherman Act in a nutshell. And so the Sherman Act isn't the only antitrust statute, but conceptually it's about two-thirds of the antitrust laws is what I'd say. And, you know, a story here is the so Senator Sherman writes the Sherman Act in 1890, Courts back then were, were uh, you know, very business friendly, and so it, it, it took some time, but courts gradually shrunk the, the effective scope of the Sherman Act, which just made it hard to prove cases under the Sherman Act. And so after about a generation, in 1914, Congress got together and passed a new set of antitrust laws called the Clayton Act. And the Clayton Act largely just shores up holes or gaps in the, the Sherman Act or extends a few other prophylactic uh, provisions. I'm not going to go through all of these, but uh, the, the one that probably is, is, is most important is Section 7 of the Sher uh, Clayton Act, which uh, outlaws mergers or acquisitions that may have the effect of substantially lessening competition or creating a monopoly. Now, under the Sherman Act, if you buy up a competitor that can be illegal under Section 1, that can be illegal under Section 2, but as Yogi Berra said, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. Th those are just hard cases to prove because you're trying to prove that a merger that happens today will result in prices increasing five years from now. That's hard to prove. And so Section 7 of the Clayton Act says, 
you don't necessarily have to prove that the merger will harm competition. You just have to prove that it may harm competition. So it arguably makes it a little easier to stop mergers or acquisitions. Um, so th this is the you know, Sherman Act and the, the, the Andrews Laws in a nutshell, but let, let's turn to now some special issues that come up in labor and employment. One thing that you might have uh, caught me saying a couple minutes ago is that a group boycott is a uh, per se illegal, hardcore, collusive activity under Section 1 of the Sherman Act. And you might be thinking, well, hey, if, if a bunch of competing companies can't get together to boycott Amazon, then how is it that a labor union, a bunch of competing workers, can get together to, to strike? And there's actually a story there. The story is best told through uh, the, the, the example of Eugene v. Debs. And it's not a Supreme Court case, Eugene versus Debs. The person you, whose name is Eugene Victor Debs. And he was one of these uh, early unionists in 1890s. He, he founded the American Railway Union. And in the early 1890s, in that capacity as the head of the union, he organized a strike of the Pullman Sleeping Car Company. It was a wildcat strike. All the workers just out of the blue walked out. And uh, it, it, it was a provocative strike, and it started to spread. And it went to other railroad factories for other companies and went to uh, non-factories, but, but railroad uh, workers started striking. And so the government took this very seriously. The government was on the side of the, the businesses, and they went after uh, Debs and got an injunction and said, Debs, you're organizing a group boycott uh, of workers that is unlawful under this new law, the Sherman Act. And a court actually said, Debs, you were enjoined from organizing further strikes. And it, it's ambiguous, you know, to what extent Debs uh, followed that. He, he wrote a letter to people, you know, stop striking, but lo and behold, the strikes continued and they ex exacerbated and turned to a pretty big situation. I mean, it was possible to to deliver mail to the city of Chicago. The president intervened and called up the, the, the National Guard to, to quell the strikes. And so one thing that the government did is they went after Debs and said, Debs, you were violating this injunction. And they threw him in jail for violating the Sherman Act. Um, what, what happened when Debs was in jail, and he was in jail for that long, six months or something, but he started reading socialist literature. And he got out of jail, jail after six months, and he was a celebrity, and he announced he was a socialist. And he started running for president. He ended up running for president five separate times. And by 1912, he got 6% of the popular vote. So he was the, you know, Bernie Sanders of his time. But uh, society had changed in that uh, in the intervening time, and there was suddenly a lot more sympathy for labor unions. So what happened was with the Clayton Act amendments in 1914, they passed a provision that said the labor of a human being is not a commodity or article of commerce. And this language has been interpreted to be a specific exemption for labor unions. That, yeah, you know, what labor unions do would normally be deemed illegal under the Sherman Act, but we don't want, as a matter of policy, the Sherman Act to apply to labor unions. So labor unions get an out. Um, now, again, businesses uh, had a... Their courts back then were very kind to businesses, and so courts immediately started to find loopholes in this provision, but uh, every time Congress came back and said, no, we mean it, the la uh, labor unions are exempt from the antitrust laws. The Norris LaGuardia Act was passed in the 30s. It makes it illegal for courts to issue injunctions against strikes. So if there's a strike, you know, it, it, it's hard to use the antitrust laws to try to break a strike. It's basically impossible to do that. Um, eventually, the Supreme Court came around to saying, you know, the labor laws give the NLRB, not antitrust courts, primary responsibility for policing the collective bargaining process. And so the, the case law isn't a model of clarity, but it's pretty clear that whenever a labor union is engaging in traditional collective bargaining, what it's doing is exempt from the antitrust laws. However, that exemption is not absolute, specifically when a labor union is doing something other than traditional collective bargaining, antitrust laws can actually apply. 
Again, the case law is not a model of clarity, and a lot of the law actually comes out of uh, professional sports disputes between leagues and players' unions. And so those cases are sometimes hard to really draw large lessons out of. But, you know, one big takeaway. There's two things you can take away today. One you, sh you, sh you should uh, take away is that you shouldn't team up. In fact, you can't team up with your competitor's labor union to try to harm your competitor. Uh, if you do that, that, that is not good faith competition under the eyes of the antitrust law. So don't do that. Don't do that. Um, but maybe to your advantage, think of ways where you might work with a labor union where the labor union is doing something other than traditional collective bargaining. So an example is a union owns a uh, subsidiary, and the union says, we need you to do business with our subsidiary or else we'll go on strike. Well, in that case, the union's using its collective bargaining power to try to get a business advantage. And you can actually have an antitrust case there. Or you know, whenever a union boss says, hey, I've got a nephew that uh, needs a job, that's the labor union essentially colluding with that nephew. You, know, you could have an antitrust claim. There are a minimum you know, a, a good answer to the union boss why you wouldn't feel comfortable giving the, the, the nephew the job because it's potentially an antitrust violation. Um, so, you know, again, the, the, the law here is complicated. and it, it, To some extent, it differs from court to court and from circuit to circuit. But the, the, the takeaway is when a labor union is doing something other than traditional collective bargaining, the antitrust laws can actually apply. Um, I, I, another particular issue in the labor and employment context, and I, th this is you know, kind of an esoteric uh, uh, issue in the hospital industry, but hospitals have what they call a medical staff, which isn't a staff in the typical HR context of you know, the people you've employed. A medical staff can be a bunch of independent physicians in the community or all self-employed or work for other companies, other practices, but they collectively are the doctors who have admitting privileges to admit patients to a hospital. And a medical staff is required to uh, police itself and create standards and protocols to ensure that the hospital is meeting certain minimum levels of care. So where this sometimes leads to conflict is you could have, let's say, you have a small town that has three specialists, three endocrinologists in the whole, uh, whole city, and they all have admitting privileges to the same hospital. Well, two of them decide that the third endocrinologist is you know, killing patients left and right or just difficult to work with. They get together and terminate that third specialist's admitting privileges, and that can be very hard for that specialist to make a living without having uh, hospital admitting privileges, especially if there's only one hospital nearby. And so these cases get pretty ugly pretty quickly because they're, they're personal cases. It's usually, you know, a, a, a couple rivals teaming up against uh, what one other doctor who now is unable to make a living. Um, the, the hospitals and medical staff often have good defenses. You know, if, if you can prove that the doctor was, in fact, killing off patients, that's a pretty good defense. But these cases are reviewed under the rule of reason. They can be kind of complicated and thorny to try. Uh, to try. Um, another issue, this is a Section 2 of the Sherman Act issue, is predatory hiring. And th this, is, th th this does not come up often, but here's the situation. You'd say you're a software company and you've got another rival software company and you think, hey, I could really hurt that competitor by just hiring away its key employees. So, you know, companies do this from time to time, and sometimes the victim of that, the, the company whose employees have been poached, will think to file a lawsuit that, hey, that was predatory, you, you, you took my uh, key employees. Well, the, the way the antitrust laws look at that, by and large, is that's not predatory. To the contrary, that's actually really good competition. That's exactly what you're supposed to be doing, competing for one another's talent. That, that's competition working. However, from time to time, courts have recognized an exception. So there's an example here. If you were to, say, hire computer programmers from a competitor and then pay them as computer programmers, you give them a computer programmer's salary, 
but not actually employ them doing computer programming, just give them some made-up job or have them work as uh, janitors or something. In that case, it, it's hard to explain how that's good faith competition. So if you do something like that, have your radar up, there could conceivably be a claim for predatory hiring. But as long as you're hiring away a competitor's talent in good faith to gainfully employ them and, and use their skills the right way, you, you, you should be safe. Now, a related issue is uh, we call it interlocking officers and directors. We, we come back to the 1914 Clayton Act amendments where they shored up gaps in the, uh, the, the Sherman Act. And so I'll just read the operative language of the statute. No person shall at the same time serve as an officer or director in any two corporations that are by virtue of their business and location of operations competitors. In a sentence, you can't be an officer or director of two competing companies at the same time. Um, a classic example, probably the, 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 the most current uh, publicized example, was in the late 2000s, Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, was on the board of directors of Apple. And likewise, there was an, uh, an outside director, another outside director who was uh, a director of both Apple and Google. And that was fine. That arrangement was fine when Google was a search company and Apple was a, you know, an iPod company. But the technologies converged such that they were both the two big players in the cell phone business. And so by the late 2000s, the FTC said, well, wait, how is it that you've got two common directors on these two big competing firms that are eating each other's uh, lunch on uh, cell phones? And so the FTC opened an investigation. Just right away, the company said, you're right, we, we shouldn't have this. You know, for, forget Section 8 of the Clayton Act. It's, it's just a conflict of interest. So uh, they, they, they had Eric Schmidt, Lee, leave the Apple board and the Apple director left the, the Google board and so they, they, they went their separate ways. So that's, that's the concept, but it actually gets pretty thorny pretty quickly. Um, one, that there are some safe harbors in the statute so that if maybe you have two business lines that are competing but they don't compete a lot, uh, then you can you know take advantage of the safe harbor. It's just very hard in practice to know when the safe harbor applies or doesn't. Um, you know, uh, other situations that come up is, you know, let's say you own, your company owns 40% of a joint venture partner and you get to appoint a, a director to the joint venture's board. Well, is that joint venture a competitor of yours? You know, it, it gets fuzzy. Or you, you're leasing an officer to another company. You, you, you are leasing one officer to another company to serve as an officer of that other company. You know, th there are always ways to make these arrangements work, but they get complicated. They're fact-dependent. So when you run into an issue like this, call counsel. Um, I'll, I'll say two things. So one, Section 8 of the Sherman Act is – just a, a prophylactic to strengthen the Sherman Act, really. So let's say your, comp your competitor has a really good salesperson who's working part-time. And you say, well, I want to hire my competitor's salesperson to also work time for me. So you have the same salesperson working part-time at two competing companies. That's a terrible idea. It would be very easy if you were to do that. It would be very easy for some clever plaintiff's lawyer to say, these guys, they're clearly price fixing. Heck, they, they've hired the same person to serve on both, is a sale per, salesperson for both companies. Clearly they're price fixing. And that, that would be a difficult case to defend. So don't hire on a part-time basis your competitors, you know, vice president of sales or chief sales officer, not because of Section 8 of the Sherman Act, uh, of the Clayton Act, rather because of Section 1 of the Sherman Act. That's just a bad idea. But, but if you can get past the conflict of interest issue, you can get past Section 1 of the Sherman Act, every time to time you, you, you might have an occasion to maybe uh, you, you want to hire your competitor's chief security officer, someone who's not going to be able to put you in antitrust jeopardy, but maybe just a savvy person who understands the industry and can do things like uh, you know, IT security. 
whenever you're facing an issue like this, reach out to counsel. There are ways to navigate it to do it the right way. Maybe you hire that person on a part-time basis, but, but don't call that person an officer per se. Um, the, the other thing I'll say is you can actually be kind of clever and strategic in, ha in using Section 8 of the Clayton Act to your advantage. So here's the situation. You have a activist shareholder who's pushing to appoint a director to your board, or you have a labor union who's pushing to have the right to appoint a director to your board. You know, if that activist or that labor union is appointing a director to your competitor's board, then you have a fair point to say, hey, you know, we'd love to work with you, but we don't think we can do that under Section A of the Clayton Act. So in that case, you're actually using it to your advantage. You're, 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 you're using it almost as a pretext to avoid doing something you wouldn't want to do otherwise. So just be, you know, thoughtful about th this prohibition on interlocking officers and directors. So with that, I'm going to transition to guidance that the two federal antitrust enforcement agencies, the DOJ and the FTC, released uh, almost a year ago for human resource professionals. And the, the issue here is the Section 1 of the Sherman Act issue. Uh, the, the DOJ and the FTC have run into cases of wage fixing or agreements between two competitors either to pay employees the same amount or not to poach one another's employees or not to cold call one another's employees. So here's another example. And I don't mean to pick on Apple and Google. It just works out that way. But in the mid-2000s, uh, Apple and Google, you know, allegedly entered into an agreement that they wouldn't cold call one another's employees. Uh, you know, think of Silicon Valley. There's, there's only so many world-class software engineers. It was probably very disruptive for the companies to constantly be losing uh, key engineers to one another, and so they just entered into a pretty formal agreement not to cold call one another's employees. Um, allegedly, Intel then entered into a similar agreement with Google as did Intuit, and Pixar and Adobe each entered into similar agreements with Apple. The DOJ found out about this, and they, uh, they, they were upset. They said this is a per se illegal violation of Section 1 of the Sherman Act. You are agreeing not to compete for talent. So the DOJ sued the companies but did so civilly and just got them agree they're not going to do it again. Um, immediately after those cases settled, however, private plaintiffs brought class action lawsuits on behalf of all the poor software engineers who had not been cold called by competing employers. And those cases ultimately settled for like $400 million. So this, this is a massive exposure for the companies. Um, what the DOJ and FTC guidance said, the, the guidance they released last year said is, they didn't change the law, but they said, if we see this again, we reserve the right, the DOJ reserves the right, to prosecute these cases criminally. We think this is egregious, collusive conduct, and in an appropriate case, the DOJ may, in the exercise of its prosecutorial discretion, bring criminal felony charges against the culpable individual. Now, it, 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 again, it's not a change in the law. If you'd asked me two years ago, hey, can I enter into a no-poach agreement with my competitor, I'd say no. If you did that, there's a fair chance you'd go to jail. And that, that advice remains the same. The, the DOJ just fired a warning shot to let people know that, uh, that, that they, they see it the same way and that they will throw uh, folks in jail in the appropriate case. I should say that the, the situation is not just limited to in the software industry in Silicon Valley, I mean, similar cases have come up over the years involving nurses where hospitals uh, w wouldn't uh, uh, pay above a certain amount for, for, for nurses' wages, and they, they did so in tandem with their competing hospitals. Uh, another case was two ski manufacturers agreed not to poach one another's celebrity endorsers, you know, that they have athletes skiers endorse their products. They agreed not to poach one another's endorsers. So th these arrangements do come up every once in a while. Um, so far, since the DOJ guidance came out a year ago, there have not been any criminal prosecutions. However, just three weeks ago, a deputy assistant attorney general at the DOJ revealed that they have investigations that are ongoing that are pretty far along. And so... Um, so, you know, 
be, keep this on your radar. We, we, we probably have not heard the end of this. Now, the, this guidance release it caused a lot of anxiety, understandably. So, and, and the guidance really isn't very clearly written. And so, just a few questions that come up all the time that I, I think will dispel some concern. So, first, the DOJ FTC guidance focuses on naked wage fixing or no solicitation agreements, by which they mean if you enter into an agreement with a competitor not to poach one another's employees or whatever, and that agreement is an end in itself, then that can be, you know, that, that is per se illegal. However, when you enter into, a, let's say, a no solicitation agreement or a no hire agreement that is a means to a further end, that's a different case. And so here's an example. You are selling a business unit and you agree that you will not hire any of the employees that are, are part of the business unit that's being sold for the next three years. That's totally fine. In fact, that's pro-competitive, and the FTC and the DOJ, when they force companies to divest business units to get mergers through, in fact, they often require businesses to agree to precisely those types of arrangements. Uh, because in that case, you're not agreeing not to hire an employee to lessen competition for the hiring of employees. You're doing it to promote the sale of the business, which is the primary agreement. Another situation is you enter into a temp agency agreement or a consulting agreement where you agree not to you know, hire or solicit any of the, the consultant or temporary workers that uh, come to your site. Now, that's totally legitimate. The government recognizes that. So don't worry about that. Um, uh, uh, another uh, important takeaway is this is Section 1 of the Sherman Act, meaning joint conduct. When your company agrees with another company not to uh, solicit one another's employees or you agree to fix wages you're not going to pay above minimum wage, that's when the DOJ FTC guidance applies. But it does not apply when your company is just acting on its own. Um, th there's, you know, a sliver of an exception to that, but that exception is, is, is so narrow that it's not even worth getting into. You know, don't, don't signal to a competitor what you're trying to do is like a, a wink and a nod to them. But short of that extreme situation, this guidance really only applies when your company is working with a competitor. Um, a, a extension of that is, you know, it happens from time to time that businesses will participate in wage or benefit surveys to find out just what what, what market wages or market benefit plans are, that's fine, but you, you should be careful when you do that. And specifically, let's say you, you participate in a wage payment survey, but it's just you and one other company that's agreeing, that, that's participating in the survey. In that case, well, yeah, it's a survey, maybe the results are anonymized, but you can reverse engineer because you know your own information. You can reverse engineer what your competitor is doing. So just have your radar screen up on that. Um, with that, I am going to segue to David for a minute. Yeah, yeah. Excuse me, Ben. I'd like to provide the continuing legal education code for this program for your audience. Um, if those of you listening in are in need of a CLE credit today, Please enter the following five-digit code into the poll question on the screen after it's announced and press, press the submit button. The code is NJSC7. That's N as in Nancy, J as in John, S as in Sally, C as in Colleen, 7. One more time. That's N as in Nancy. J as in John, S as in Sally, C as in Colleen, 7. Once again, if you are seeking CLE credit for this session, please complete the, complete the polling question by entering the code that has just been announced. The polling question will remain open only briefly. For those seeking Kansas, New York, or New Jersey CLE credit, in addition to the polling question, you will need to complete the attorney affirmation form and return it immediately after the program. A copy of the form can be found in the resource list widget. As a reminder, certificates of attendance will be distributed to eligible participants approximately eight weeks after the web conference via email. 
At this point, the poll is closed, and I'd like to return the program to our speaker, Ben. Thank you, David. Got to get those CLEs. So um, with, I wanted to turn to a quirky issue that comes up every once in a while in the executive compensation situation. So this requires telling another story. So you recall in 1890, the Sherman Act is passed. Sherman Act makes mergers or acquisitions that harm competition illegal. Those are just hard cases to prove. So in 1914, they shore up that gap in the statute, make it a little easier to prove. Now, unfortunately, what they didn't do was give the government a way to find out that a big merger was going to happen until they just happened to read about it in the news or because someone complained. So here are situations that came up. Here's a classic example. May 1957 a pipeline company called El Paso Natural Gas Company bought its competitor. The government didn't find out until the deal closed, and uh, they, they immediately saw there was a problem. It took them a couple months to file a lawsuit, but in July of that year, they did. The litigation dragged out for seven years, which in today's terms is actually a pretty short time frame. I mean, to today, a case like this could have gone on for 20 years. But the, the litigation went until 1967 when the Supreme Court finally and definitively said this merger violated the Clayton Act, it must be unwound, and they, they ordered El Paso Natural Gas to divest the business that it acquired. Now, unfortunately for El Paso, it had been scrambling the eggs for seven years, and so it took literally another 10 years to unscramble that eggs, uh, the, the, those eggs. And so that was just a bad result for everyone. It was bad for El Paso, it was bad for the government, it was really bad for the consumers who during the intervening 17 years were presumably paying more than they should have been paying for pipelines. So Congress got together and they said, there's got to be a better way. It was two senators, Hart and Scott, and a congressman, Rodino, and they passed the Hart-Scott-Rodino Act, uh, the Hart-Scott-Rodino Antitrust Improvements Act. Um, it was the first pre-merger notification system in the whole world, and so, yeah, the, the U.S. had it first. The U.S. might not have had it best. There are other countries that have more refined merger systems that focus on reporting deals that might be problematic. That's not the approach the, the U.S. took. The U.S. approach is deals that are larger than certain statutory thresholds have to be reported, even if they're not problematic in the slightest. And this, every once in a while, brings up an executive compensation issue. So, so um, here are the requirements. If you meet the relevant statutory thresholds, you have to file a notification with the government before the merger closes or the acquisition closes. You have to pay a filing fee. The filing fees are very large. The smallest filing fee is $45,000. The highest is a uh, quarter million dollars. You have to observe a waiting period, usually 30 days, between when you file the notification and when the transaction can close. And you give the chance, the government just a chance to open a small investigation if they uh, see any problems with the merger. So here in uh, as close to layman's terms as I, I, I can muster, here's the most important threshold to be aware of. Whenever an acquisition arguably may result in the acquirer holding assets, voting securities, or non-corporate interests, that are plausibly worth more than $80.8 .8 million in the aggregate, then you should call Hart Scott Rodino Council. Um, it's a complicated test just because the rules are very complicated. And picture a minor, miniature IRS code just for when you have to notify a, 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 a merger to the government. But the key for executive comp purposes is the phrase in the aggregate. So I mean, he, here's the situation. Your, your CEO owns $80 million in company stock and then decides, for whatever reason, to buy another million dollars in stock. In that case, your, your CEO's $80 million existing, uh, of existing holdings will be aggregated with the $1 million of new holdings. And for HSR purposes, that $1 million acquisition is resulting in your CEO holding, in the aggregate, $81 million of company stock. That deal can actually be reportable. Um, and I, I should also pause, $80.8 .8 million is an oddball number. It's because it was $50 million in the year 2000, and every year they increase that threshold a little for inflation. So that's why you have a weird number like $80.8 .8 million. It goes up maybe a million or $2 a year for inflation. 
Um, so every once in a while, you have an executive compensation uh, arrangement that can actually trigger an HSR filing. So here are some examples. Say your CEO owns 80 million shares in the company, and the, the company's stock is worth one dollar originally when the stocks were uh, stock was issued, but due to the latest round in funding, your stock's now worth two dollars a share. Is that reportable? And the answer is no, because your CEO is not buying any new shares or acquiring any new shares. Rather, that's just her existing holdings increasing in value without actually adding to the holdings. So that's not reportable. However, same situation, your CEO now owns $160 million worth of uh, stock, but the CEO wants to buy one more lousy share on the open market or from another seller, just wants to buy one more share. Is that report, uh, reportable? The answer is yes, because the CEO is making an acquisition that results in her holding more than $80.8 .8 million of company stock in the aggregate. So in that case, you have to notify the government. Another situation, this gets closer to executive compensation. The CEO isn't buying another share on the open market. The CEO is just exercising a stock option that was granted to her for doing a good job. Is that reportable? The answer is yes, potentially. There's an exemption if she's just making a cashless exercise where she exercises the option but then immediately sells all those shares the same day just to get the, 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 the money represented by the option value. There's an out for that, but if the CEO plans on exercising the option and holding on to that stock for a couple days or indefinitely, that is uh, HSR reportable, potentially. Um, a twist on that situation, the CEO, same situation, the CEO isn't actually buying stock or exercising an option. Rather, she's just enrolled in a passive stock reinvestment plan. So every time the company stock pays a dividend, that dividend is applied to buy more shares of stock. Well, lo and behold, in that situation, the 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 dividend reinvestment can create an acquisition that results in the CEO holding more than $80.8 .8 million in the aggregate. That can be reportable. And then situation five, the exact same situation as any of two, through, uh, two three, or four, but instead of the CEO replace that word with some other officer or director or highly compensated employee, can that be reportable? The answer is yes. So even beyond that, let's say you, you, you went through this five years ago, you, you, you think you're covered. That's not necessarily the case. First of all, there's five separate reporting thresholds. So once you cross the $80.8 .8 million threshold, you have to file a notification. But then if you go from $80.8 .8 million in holdings to greater than $161.5 million in holdings, you can have to do a separate filing. Again, it, Eight hundred seven and a half million, as follows. So they're separate notifications. You sometimes have to make multiple notifications for the same person. Additionally, once you've made a notification, you can make additional acquisitions as long as they don't cross the threshold, but only for the next five years. Once those five years are up, you actually have to make a new filing and pay a new filing fee to the government. So. Um, I, I should caution here and say that if you've got a sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach that, oh, man, I, I think we, we screwed this up, that's fine. Just call counsel. Um, but there's a procedure to notify the government when you have made an inadvertent failure to file, and typically they're, 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 they're forgiving about this. They, they realize that you know, it's CEO exercising a stock option probably is not a serious antitrust violation, and so they'll – make you, you know, say how the mistake happened, what you're going to do to make sure it doesn't happen again. But more often than not, they'll, they'll give you a letter, hey, don't do it again. But, you, you know, you, you want to make sure you, you do that the right way and that you, uh, you, you, you approach the government the right way. And one last point I'll talk about on HS, uh, Hart's Carradino. This is outside the context of executive compensation. But when you're working on a big deal that will require a Hart's Carradino filing, the biggest part of that filing is a document request. You have to provide documents to the DOJ and to the FTC that were prepared by or for any officers or directors in connection with the deal process that 
speak in terms of competition or market shares or markets or things like that, or synergies. And so you, you'll have HR-related documents where you're, you're doing a synergy analysis. Uh, where, where, where can you uh, ha have layoffs? So any documents of that nature that are prepared by or for an officer or a director, either of the parties to the deal or of a parent company or of a sister company or uh, a child company, those types of documents physically get submitted to the government, and the government will be reviewing them for antitrust concerns. So those types of documents are not the place to make a casual remark that you think this deal might pose antitrust risks or you're, you're concerned about lessening competition or raising prices or something like that. Just be mindful when you're working on a deal that is Hart Scott Rodino reportable that things you put in writing might be seen by other people. That's just a practice point. With our remaining time, I wanted to quickly end on antitrust compliance policy. So if you're not doing so already, I would encourage everyone on the phone to give serious consideration to incorporating antitrust compliance training into employee onboarding and just periodic training. So think about where your risk points are. You know, it, it, it's not literally the case that everyone, every company can put you in antitrust jeopardy, but if you are a retail business, you know, you think about who's setting prices, who's setting strategy, who's in a position to do something, you know, work with a competitor the wrong way uh, and, and put your company at risk of antitrust liability. And, and so provide training to those people and, you know, tailor it, tailor it, tailor it. If it's just some boilerplate, it'll go in one ear and out the other. But you really try to reach people to avoid, the, the, you know, winding up on the criminal end of a DOJ prosecution or you know, the defense end of some class action uh, antitrust case. Um, further, if you don't have one already, give thought to adopting an antitrust compliance policy. And I'm picturing, you know, if you have a binder with corporate compliance policies on a bunch of different areas of compliance, you know, five to 25 pages of that could be an antitrust compliance policy. And, you know, there, there's several reasons to do this. First and foremost, to prevent violations, and second, to detect violations early on if they happen before they cause larger problems, but also in the event that a violation happens and you, you have to defend your, your company, it's very helpful to have an antitrust compliance policy that you can point to and say, government, we, 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 we're, we're an ethical company, we're mindful of these risks, you know, we wouldn't just slip past the goalie here, but, uh, you know, the, the, the government wants companies to have antitrust compliance policies that come from the top of the organization on down. They want them to be set by the board. Um, they, they want to uh, create a mechanism to allow employees who find out about an antitrust violation to notify someone, call a hotline or something like this. They want proactive training and monitoring, and they also want well-thought-out consequences, consequences for any violations. Now, it's not required as a matter of law, that anyone who commits an antitrust violation gets fired on the spot. But think about that. You know, that, that could be an, an appropriate remedy or consequence for uh, putting your company in jeopardy. So some conclusions for, for, from today. First, you know, two things to take away. Don't collude with your competitor's labor union. And two, don't collude with another company about the terms of employment, or, or uh, not to poach one another's employees. Either of those two things will put you in a world of trouble. Short of those two things that uh, you, know, you, you, you get in a lot of trouble for, there are more technical requirements. Don't have interlocking officers or directors under Section 8 of the Clayton Act. Have some system for keeping track of any officers, employees, directors who might hold or acquire more than $80.8 .8 million in shares in case you have to make a notification under the HSR Act, and give due consideration to incorporating antitrust training and compliance into employee onboarding and ongoing uh, compliance. So with that, we've reached the end of our hour. I want to thank everyone for joining. I'd be more than happy to stay around and answer any questions. Um, I don't see any questions, uh, that, that any questions have been submitted, but I'll hold on for a minute. If anyone wants to use the widget to submit questions, um, 
Alternatively, you know, please feel free to send me an email or reach out to me if anyone has any questions about today. Uh, my email address is bdryden at foley.com. So, uh, again, I'll, I'll hold on for a minute to see if there are any other questions. But thank you all very much for your time today. Ben, this is David. I'd just like to step in for a moment and thank everybody for joining us today and to invite them to, con to contact you if they have any questions or need any more information about their particular topics. This does wrap up our web conference today. For uh, just a reminder, today's program has been recorded and will be available on uh, Foley's website in the next few days. Um, at the conclusion of this program, a questionnaire will appear on your screens. Um, please, please take a minute or two to give us your feedback about the presentation. It's important for us to know your thoughts, um, and it helps us shape our programs going forward. Um, if you have any other questions regarding this program, you can contact me, David Wise, at dwise at foley.com. Thanks again for your participation, and have a great day.